welcome to Artificiality, where minds meet machines. We founded Artificiality to help people make sense of artificial intelligence. Every week, we publish essays, podcasts, and research to help you be smarter about AI. Please check out all of Artificiality at www.artificiality.world. We're excited to welcome Jamie Boyle to the podcast. Jamie's a law professor and author of the thought-provoking book, The Line, AI and the Future of Personhood. In The Line, Jamie challenges our assumptions about personhood and humanity, arguing that these boundaries are more fluid than traditionally believed. He explores diverse contexts like animal rights, corporate personhood, and AI development to illustrate how debates around personhood permeate philosophy, law, art, and morality. Jamie uses fascinating examples from science fiction, legal history, and philosophy to illustrate the challenges we face in defining the rights and moral status of artificial entities. He argues that grappling with these questions may lead to a profound re-examination of human identity and consciousness. What's particularly compelling about Jamie's approach is how he frames this as a journey of moral expansion, drawing parallels to how we've expanded our circle of empathy in the past. He also offers surprising insights into legal history, revealing how corporate personhood emerged more by accident than design, a cautionary tale as we consider AI rights. We believe this book is both ahead of its time and right on time. It sharpens our understanding of difficult concepts, namely that the boundaries between organic and synthetic are blurring, creating profound existential challenges we need to prepare for now. To quote Jamie from the line, Grappling with the question of synthetic others may bring about a re-examination of the nature of human identity and consciousness. I want to stress the potential magnitude of that re-examination. This process may offer challenges to our self-conception unparalleled since secular philosophers declared that we would have to learn to live with a God-shaped hole at the center of the universe. Let's dive into our conversation with Jamie Boyle. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us. We're really excited to talk to you today. Thanks for having me. This is, this is a great opportunity. Let's start with uh, a nice opening question. What inspired you to write this book? I basically spent most of my youth deeply with my nose in a science fiction book. And that led me to think about a lot of things that weren't reality uh, at that point, but might be one day. One of those things was the internet, which I became convinced from reading cyberpunk novels um, in the late 70s and early 80s was going to be um, something real. And so I sort of started writing and doing scholarship about that sort of before it was a thing in the early 90s. Um, And that turned out to be a good thing um, and led to a lot of insight. And so the obvious question was, okay, what's the next big thing? And the the idea of artificial intelligence has always fascinated me and the idea of rights has always fascinated me and i thought what if we put the two together and try and work out in a realistic and humanistic way what might happen if we encountered beings that were artificially created by us but were also plausibly like us in ways that seem to cry out for moral recognition. And the book came from there. I'm particularly interested in this book because, I mean, I'll just jump straight to the, right, to to the meat of the matter, if you will, in that what we focus on is this intersection between the organic and the synthetic. And we talk about a new state of being as the artificiality, that's where our name comes from. And this question of what is organic, what is synthetic, where is the boundary between those two? Is there really a boundary between these two? Is it something separate from us that we're holding that is unique and different? Or is it, is it what we're holding an extension of ourselves and therefore still part of us? And so how do we know what the difference is? And so the concept of this line and the question about the line in and bringing a legal mind to it was really fascinating because, you know, we come at it from a a scientific and a philosophical perspective and you bring a different perspective to it that I found to be really fascinating and interesting. 
So first of all, thank you for writing the book because actually it's really <laughs> Thanks interesting. Thanks for reading it. <laughs> it's really interesting addition to the scholarship that we can tap into. That line is exactly the one. I mean, that's what the title refers to, and it's obviously a line that is you know, a moment's thought makes us realize that a lot of the things we think about it are either probably wrong or incomplete. I mean, if if Mr. Spock and Mr. Data turned up on your doorstep tomorrow, I don't think you'd go, well, neither are you human, so I'm off to the gulag. I mean, it just, it doesn't seem like that's what your reaction would be. And, but, at the same time, people have very legitimate fears that... AI is a threat, and that's obviously something that you concentrated on in your discussion of artificiality, a threat to our lives, to the world, a threat to art, a threat to our jobs, but also a threat to our own sense of being special, of being unique. I mean, one of the things, you know, I spend a lot of time diving into pretty much every discipline to, say, to see what they had to say about the line, and one of the things is philosophers have been philosophizing about the line pretty much as long as they've been philosophizing about anything and trying to say, well, why are we different than non-human animals? Why are we different from things? Like, what explains it? Aristotle said, well, it's language. Language lets us reason about how to do things, how to get something. There's a nice grape. I want to eat it. Um, I'll climb. But it also lets us reason about what's right to do. Wait, that's my neighbor's grape. I shouldn't do that. And he goes, and that creates the polis, the city state. That creates law. That creates nomos. That creates morality. Um, and honestly, you know, we've been noodling on that point ever since. And I'm not sure we've done that much better than Aristotle did. And now come what you know probably better than I are, cha you know, chatbots, which are not in any way conscious and yet which present us with wonderful emulations of human language. And I'm just sort of fascinated to what that does to us. What is not just like, you know, will they kill us? It's like, will they make us look in the mirror? Are they a mirror? And so that's the thing that I think is truly fascinating about this. And somebody might come away from my book saying, I am frightened that I used to be worried about corporate rights, and now I'm worried about AI rights. They're going to take over everything, and they'll have lawyers like you on retainer saying that they deserve rights. I think that's a perfectly legitimate fear. Um, but I the, also think it's a perfectly legitimate fear to think maybe we won't handle it well because we deny personhood to our own species. Sorry, yeah, Ellen. Yeah. Oh, no, it, it, I just, I'm, I'm just as fascinated with this as as as, uh, as you are, and um, coming at that legal side just sort of was just so new to me. So I just found that really fascinating. But just going back to some one of the things you said, I, one of my favourite sentences in your fabulously written book is um, sentences don't imply sen sentience. You know, don't mean sentience. And I and um, it it's it's so intriguing how we just describe sentience. But also going back to what, um, you, you know, your reference to, to Aristotle and maybe we haven't done, we haven't got that far because, and I just really enjoyed this distinction you pulled out about the, um, it's what the capabilities that language gives us, not language per se. Mm -hmm. And to me, that felt like quite a clear distinction when, when in the way that you presented it. But at the same time, what overwhelmed me in some ways was just the realizing just how unclear all of these lines are. That your first cut at a, at a, distinct, at a, at a distinction might be feel relatively sort of clear. Uh, there might be the sense of clarity. Oh, yep, I got it now. That's, that's on one side and that's on the other. But then the more you think about it, the less clear these things are. And... I'm I'm wondering about after you've after you went through this journey of writing the book and thinking about it, what is it that drives this lack of clarity? You know, is it just the sheer complexity of the world? Is it something kind of different again that these divisions are just so you know essentially unclear? That's that is such a great and deep question. Basically, I wrote the book to try and answer that question for myself because I didn't know the answer. I, I hope I'm closer to the answer now, having written it, than I was before. Although I'm, I, I say in the book a lot of times, this is a, a book about how to think about the issue, not a book about what to think about the issue, because I, I'm just trying to help us think it all through it. 
For me, I think that we have very strong instincts, which most of the time are right. So think of like Newtonian physics. If you if your basic model of the world is Newtonian, you know, force mass equals acceleration, and you know every action equal and opposite reaction, that works for almost everything that you encounter in your daily life. For that to stop working, you have to be either very very sm dealing with stuff that's really really small or really really fast or really far away or in the quanta, and at that point it's wrong. And it is wrong, but it's sort of like, but that Newtonian sort of set of heuristics, that functions fine, right? And for most of us, that's what we spend most of it. We don't, no one's thinking about quantum physics when they're driving their car, or if they do, they're a danger and they shouldn't be on the road. <laughs> I think there's a moral equivalent to that point, which is most of the time you say, look, humans have human rights because they're human, not because they're smart or because they're white or because they're a man or because they're straight or because they're a Christian. It's humans have human rights. And that's just a really great line. And 99.9999 times out of 100, that's right. And then if I give you the Mr. Spock and Mr. Data example, you go, well, okay, so it's not actually being genetically human that is what I really care about in terms of my morality. You've made me realize that in the same way as Einstein makes you realize, actually the Newton stuff doesn't always work. And so I think what we've done is we've introduced a technology, AI, that is the equivalent to finally being able to do the measurements that told us we should look away from Newtonian physics towards relativity. And it's messing with our heads because we're like, wait, I liked Newtonian physics. It really made, I learned it in high school. It's sort of, I worked hard for that B. And so I think that we're going through the moral equivalent of that right now. And we're doing it, having just done it, I would say over non-human animals. I think everyone, regardless of whether you're a, you know, people for the ethical treatment of animals all the way, or whether you're a, you know, a carnivore with some reservations about it or whatever you are, there's no way you're thinking about the rights of non-human animals today the way that someone was 50 years ago. I mean, you shouldn't be at least. And so I think what's going on is that it happens a lot with law, it happens with philosophy, it happens in life. A technology destabilizes a line that up to now seemed normal that we didn't have to think about. And now we're being made to think about it in the same way that, you know, Thinking about light speed made us think about physics. Sure, because we we've had these uh, some number of hundreds of years of humanism of feeling like we're the center of the universe. We're the only th we're the thing that is you know holds the divine. We hold all of the answers. We're the only intelligent being. We're the only thing with agency. Everything is all so incredibly special. And then we inventing machines that at least in certain things, can surpass us. And we've got predictions coming from Silicon Valley that it'll be smarter than us any time between, you know, three months from now and, you know, <laughs> a, a decade from now. Who knows? But they, their objective is. And so the intelligence barrier seems to kind of fall apart. And then you still look at these things and wonder whether whether they are a thing that's different. You know, where where's the... Um, how much of my memory that I've outsourced to my device or to my cloud is me and therefore mm. should be thought of in the same way and the same rights. Uh, where, when do things that, you know, get attached or implanted in me become me? Yeah. Um, you know, we sort of, it, it, I think we're having to stop and because of these sort of changes in technology, really reevaluate the, the core question of what it means to be human. And this sort of question of what, I, I'm not sure where to draw that line. You know, mm -hmm. you know, we have these questions of like, um, so if I, you know, uh, don't even touch my phone, but if I ask, uh, I'm going to have to hold it far away so it doesn't wake up Siri, um, mm -hmm. to uh, call my dad, um, am I making that phone call? Mm -hmm. Or is my machine making it? Because no matter how many times I've, I've phoned him, I, I, I can't remember his phone number. I've outsourced that. I put that memory into my phone and I've left it there and it's making the action. And so this, this question of line is really fascinating, you know? Yeah. Um, and um, I'm curious as you, you, you said before we, we, we started the interview that it, it, you've been working on this book for quite some number of years. Um, 
I'm curious what might have changed during that time, because this technology that we're talking about that's actually featured so highly in this book wasn't there when you started this journey, I don't think. And so mm. I'm curious how that journey changed. You're sitting here writing about this line, and obviously the line is changing while you're writing the book. <laughs> yes, indeed. And what's more, writing it for an academic press, an excellent academic press, which um, I wrote the first draft that MIT got before ChatGPT3 came out. Um, and then had to rewrite it many times, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and they sat on it and sat on it. I was like, this is kind of a live topic. You know, you might want to get that book out here, you know, sort of like, <laughs> so I feel that um, with AI, we've gone from um, incomprehension to boredom with the technology without passing through the intermediate stage of enlightenment. And it's sort of like, you know, it was like, it can do what? And then it went straight to, okay, I can, you know, get it to write a Shakespeare sonnet about pulling a peanut butter sandwich out of a VCR. Um, and then, you know, people move on and they move to something else. And so I actually think that the funny thing to me is, you know, the, the examples you mentioned, I mean, there's, as you know, there's great philosophy about, you know, is my diary a part of me? What if I was a person who had um, severe Alzheimer's and the only way that I can remember thing is literally to write it down? How can you say that it's not a part of that person or that they don't have the attributes you have, right? You know, that seems you definitely don't want to do that. Um, and we, we all have totemic objects that, you know, we kind of feel are sort of somehow part of us or infused with us. And so we've explored that before, but I don't think we've had to do it with... Um, entities that, um, going back to Helen's point, that where sentences don't imply sentience. And the, so the, the funny thing for me is that the technology that is prompting us to think about this issue, and I'm going to say the issue is what would a machine have to be before we would feel morally compelled to recognize some kind of personality in it or some kind of personhood, is probably the worst in terms of actually presenting that issue, because uh, as we all know, chatbots are, they're, they're complete the next word machine. They're, they're autocomplete. So they're, they're enormous autocomplete machines. And they can do this. And But the point is, what might the, and this is why your point about how fast it's changing, what might the next technology be like? I mean, what if you had something that, so they can do syntax, they can't do semantics, right? The, the shape of the sentences, they're brilliant at predicting. The, even the, the, the words to put in there, but they don't know what they mean. But what if a, uh, an AI equipped with robots learned by actual encounters with the tactile world in the same way a child does? Are you genuinely going to say that because it's thinking is going on in ones and zeros and silicone, that it couldn't have consciousness? You know, why is that? So the current technology isn't there. Um, and even a very capable, you know, chat GPT 700 might be able to fly a plane and write a sonnet and and even paint something with some meaning, but it still might not be conscious. So it could be incredibly capable and not present a difficult moral case, but it's also possible that it might. And I guess my question is, why not start thinking about that now, right? Why wait <laughs> until, uh, until the moment is forced upon us, um, particularly because that will get caught up in other political issues. And, and ideally, we don't want to do that. Yeah, I think you said something about Better do it before we have to do it with outrage on the internet. Yes. Yeah. I've heard um, there is outrage on the internet. That's, well, that's what they tell me. Yeah. yeah. And I think, <laughs> I, I, actually, I just had up here a great quote from you. Uh, Eliminating the shouting was always an unrealistic ambition. <laughs> 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 I think that's very much, very much the pithiness of the book. It, uh, can I ask you, it, it's a little bit of a um, writing process versus um, the scholarship that you study. That, that It almost seems like there's this key insight here where there isn't we've got to sort of break ourselves away from seeing looking for clear lines of division and get more sophisticated and be able to handle the complexity of what you say is um, empathy and pragmatism in an unstable equilibrium was that something that it was a generalized idea that you brought to the subject or was that something that you had an insight and basically discovered as you went through the process of writing? Very much the latter. 
Um, I mean, partly it was presenting early versions of this. I mean, Dave asked before, you know, what was what's changed at the time you did it? The first time when I started presenting ideas like this in 2010, people thought I was an absolutely stark, raving, raving bonkers. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, just like, <laughs> what the, oh, God, Boyle, he used to be a good academic. You know, he was pretty respectable. <laughs> and like, what happened? You know, another another boy ruined by a book. And 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 now people are like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe he might be up to something or getting something. And I started very much with my head in the empathy side of things, both because that's my sort of moral philosophy a predisposition. I'm a Scot. And I think that Adam Smith was onto something when he wrote about the theory of the moral sentiments, that our morality is rooted in the experience of empathy. My eyes look into yours and I don't feel your pain, but I see you having pain and I relate it to my experience of pain and the spark crosses the gap. And everything that follows in terms of me, I mean, maybe I end up a utilitarian, maybe I end up a Kantian, but it all starts from the fact that I don't think that you're a toaster. And so, you know, otherwise there's no moral game. So I started there. And when I presented it to colleagues, and this is a wonderful thing about being in academia, a lot of people said, well, that's not going to be the way that it develops. What's going to happen is it's going to be basically the history of corporate personality. We'll give them rights so we can sue them, which is quite possible. And there was an, even an EU draft directive that you know floated that idea, robot rights, just so that you know when the self-driving car kills someone, maybe we actually ought to be able to like have an entity that we can sue rather than just the, the corporation behind it which made it a very different kind of story and pushed me in directions that I never thought I would go in. I didn't think I'd end up writing about corporate personality. Um, and similarly, thinking about the empathy side made me write about non-human animals. Uh, and I didn't think I'd end up going there either. And both of those sort of journeys ended up contributing insight to the process. So you're absolutely right. This was a writing process. This is where I ended up, not where I started. The, the, one of the things that, that I particularly appreciate about the way you've structured the book is that it has quite a lot of structure in it. You're guided through, there's plenty of moments to sort of take your breath and remember why you were here in the first place. Because it does cover so much ground, I tell you, one of the things that just kind of blew me away was because um, I didn't grow up in the US and I didn't go to grade school and learn about everything to do with the Constitution, I was and a really recently, kind of a recent immigrant, I think 16 years ago today that I left New Zealand, I was kind of blown away by the section on corporate personhood and the the fascinating story that sits behind how that even kind of evolved. And um, can you tell us more about, I think you called it, the decision that was never made yeah. and your... You know, I know you say you can't write a melodrama that that includes Roscoe Conkling, but it, it's a sort of a fascinating subject and is very revealing, if not, I mean, it's a bit depressing about where we might go with these robot rights if we think about it as a as a person yes, in a corporate absolutely. sense. But it's just so much colour there. There absolutely is, and, and to- honestly, it shocked me. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm a law professor in the United States, so perforce I had to learn about the U.S. Constitution. And I knew the vague outlines, but I assumed that the development of corporate personality had had much more intentionality behind it, and nothing could be less true. So Justice Rehnquist, who until the Chief Justice Rehnquist, who until the, the current court, was probably the most, one of the most conservative Supreme Court justices in recent history, was fascinatingly, a critic of corporate personality, not so much that corporations should have personality, I, I think they should to be able to make deals and so forth, but rather what is what comes with that? What constitutional rights do they deserve? For example, do they get free speech rights just like human beings? Do they get equal protection rights just like human beings? And he said, rightly, that, um, that this was a decision which was made without argument or discussion and in terms of the legal precedent on which it raised, that's absolutely right. This is something that the court actually didn't decide. The reporter, the case reporter sort of put in, oh, and the court all thinks that corporations have equal protection rights. It wasn't argued in front of the court. And we've been citing that case ever since. But it's sort of citing a case that didn't decide anything for that purpose. And now the edifice is relatively secure. But you could say, 
but it rests on this failure ever to fully justify it. You know, why should said, yes, I want corporations to have some rights. I think there's a lot of economic advantages to us to have corporations have rights, have them be able to sue and be sued and so forth. And maybe even some constitutional protections. So maybe due process protections if they're, if corporate pers- uh, corporate property is expropriated, or maybe the First Amendment talks about freedom of the speech and the press. So that seems to say, well, the New York Times is a corporation, and it seems to get some rights out of that. But beyond that, it, it's just sort of untheorized or under-theorized. And as I say in the book, the history is that the rights in the magnificent um, Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the 14th Amendment was obviously not written for the benefit of corporations, but for the first hundred years of um, its existence, it was corporations, and pretty much only corporations, that were able fully to benefit from it, and those African Americans who brought cases generally lost. And so I think people who worry about Um, basically AI rights being citizens united, an infamous case that uh, gave corporations various speech rights, constitutional speech rights in the United States on steroids. I think there's a reason to worry about that because if we had this wonderful history of figuring it out and coming to good legal and moral and philosophical reasons, exactly what constitutional rights corporations should have, that's something we could really learn from. We could see what we did right, what we did wrong, and we could think about that when we do AI. The fact that we just sort of bumbled through it accidentally and ended up it's instantiating into law something that was never really thoroughly justified, I think is probably not the right way to proceed the next time. How do you think about the relative value of using corporate rights and animal rights as history and lessons learned as we think about this? I, I mean, you're my readers and you have more say than I. I thought it was really helpful for me. Um, so the thing that I found in writing about the, non, the, the movement for non-animal, non-human um, animals' rights was both that it was very inspiring and that I was deeply moved by some of the suits on behalf of, for example, chimpanzees and became convinced in writing this book that at least the the great primates and the cetaceans have a very good case, moral case, to have a higher legal, higher legal protections than they currently have, whether or not that's any form of personhood is a question, but, a, but much higher protections, not just cruelty to animal protections, but actually recognition that they have interests and life plans and so forth that we should respect morally speaking. And I became convinced of that. So score one for the bioethicists and moral philosophers. But I also figured out that, um, like everybody, ethicists are always fighting the last war. Generals fight the last war. Philosophers fight the last war. The last war in this moral philosophy was the rights of non-human animals. And to the winning move there, and the move that I support ethically is to say, look, it's not the fact that you have human DNA that gives you rights. It's not because you're just a membership of the species. That's too trivial. That's like saying it's because I'm white. Um, It's not that. You have to look at the capabilities that you have that entitle you to protection. And when we do that, we realize, we should realize that animals have many more capabilities than we have given them credit for. And we should also realize that the gaps between the species are not as absolute as we had thought. And I mean, I agree with that. Uh, I think that's all true. But that led philosophers, moral philosophers to say, so being human is a morally irrelevant fact, just like being white or being a man. And there I was like, oh, I think I have to get off the bus at this point. Because if you're saying that you only get rights if you have a certain set of moral, of mental capacities, what does that say to um, the anencephalic child, the, the baby that is born, you know, basically with almost no brain. And their answer is, well, I guess we have to give them rights because the line drawing is hard. And I'm kind of, uh, I don't, I don't like where this bus is going. I, I, I think that the movement for human rights for all humans, regardless of anything, race, sex, whatever, but also mental abilities, is one of the most noble struggles in human history. And for us to compare it to racism and sexism, you're just being humanist, is, I think, missing something. You miss a lot of subtlety and detail there. And so the view that I end up putting in the book, which a lot of moral philosophers will violently disagree with, is 
that we should actually have a hybrid approach, which says if you're human, you're inside our light and it doesn't matter, you know, what mental capabilities you have. And if you have the following set of capabilities, which we're still arguing about, you should be inside our line. So on the, that's on the, the animal rights side. On the corporation side, the answer is much shorter. It made me think that we really needed to avoid the errors that we committed with corporate personality and that maybe AI might even help us rethink corporate personality. Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge to use those as, as sort of precedents in that, you know, it, uh, it took us a long time to get to the current decision on both, you know, both of those topics. And at, as you say, we sort of accidentally ended up in one, or I'll put the word accidentally, um, unintentionally sort of ended up with corporate rights. But both, I mean, non-human animals have been around a very, very long time. Um, and uh, corporations have been around for a long time, and we kind of didn't deal with it for a long time. Mm. And But now we've got this sort of question about how quickly we have to think about AI rights and how to define the line. And I wonder what you'd say, what you, how you'd think about that in terms of establishing some form of um, legal definition of precedent i'm not going to use the correct words so hopefully mm -hmm. you'll 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 correct me um uh, uh prior to it being an issue versus waiting until some form of chat gpt you know as you say version 700 um and when it might feel like we kind of should have gotten on with it and dealing with this a little while before i think that's a very good way of putting it and um so some of the people who've written about this, you know, long ago, even before I started writing it, and then that was, you know, 15 years ago. Um, one of the guys said, you know, we, we're we're best when we stay in, in uh, Lawrence Solom, we're best when we sh stay in sort of shallow waters, that we don't go too deep, because we can't know the experiences that we will have that will cause us to rethink our line. And so trying to reason in the absence of those experiences is a mistake. And, you know, I'm kind of a pragmatist and I'm British, so bumbling through is basically my, you know, it's a national strategy and, 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 and probably a personal strategy. With a nice so, cup of tea. Yeah, with a nice <laughs> cup of tea and, and, and a great deal of sarcasm and not much actually getting done. Um, and so I, I, def I very much think that. But what I think we can do, so... Yes, the idea of, you know, me, this is why I very much didn't want to make the books like, here's the right answer. Because like, frankly, I think that's ludicrous. I don't think anyone has any idea right now. And I don't think they could, to be honest. But what I think we can do is try and make us be more morally sensitive so that the issue will f be flagged when it comes up. Either, wow, we're treating these entities wrongly or oh my God, we've given them rights that are dangerous. And the analogy I'd use is how wrong we have been in the past about other sort of big moral changes. Um, I remember when um, I first started being a law professor, I was uh, being an activist for uh, gay students in our school who were, uh, at that point, the US Army um, was not interviewing gay students. And I felt that this was a moral issue, that we wouldn't allow the army to interview on campus if they wouldn't take black students. And I thought that this raised a similar issue. And the dean was a very distinguished human rights lawyer, himself actually a survivor of the concentration camps, and you know, a very deeply moral person. And he said, how dare you sully the language of human rights with lifestyle issues, which is how he saw gay rights. I think now we'd probably go, yeah, you kind of missed on that one, you know, maybe a little bit wrong. Um, I remember similarly people raising environmental issues about global climate change in sort of left-wing circles uh, when I was a teenager and people going, how can you talk about this kind of bullshit? You should be talking about, you know, union rights, right? How can you, or people talking about the rights of non-human animals. It's like, don't you realize there are human beings that are suffering? And our answer to raising any new question, and those issues all were new questions, uh, were not new questions, but questions that needed, that urgently needed answers. They were old questions, but ones we'd managed to ignore, going back to Heller's point, is that people are very quick to um, dismiss it with a what about. What about 
you know, don't worry about the AIs. What about, you know, slave labor? What about child labor? I totally agree. And this isn't, it's like, oh, spend all your time gazing them in your navel and thinking about AI rights. But it is, given our history of being dramatically wrong in the past, shouldn't we have just a little bit of humility that we're kind of grokking this one correctly right now? Yeah, <clears throat> I um, agree. And I, I'm, I was thinking about, made me think about um, kind of moral luck flipping it on its head and saying, well, I'm a human. I was born a human, so I got that moral luck. How would I look at this in a different, in a different way? And um, in the chapter, in the part on chimeras, which I think is really a fascinating area because it's almost the area that's moving the fastest and the most unusual, you know. So it's, and, and you point out that it's, we've got to get somewhere past the idea of, well, that one was fine, but this one's yucky. And putting that yuck factor in as being our guiding sort of intuition. Um, but then on the same, because I think the yuck factor with chimeras has been kind of all the same. It's been a bit generic, but that will start to diverge. And some people will have really strong reactions against and others will be, um, oh, yeah, I'll take that if it's going to make me smarter or if, if I can be part of that chimera. Because we hear that, you know, in Silicon Valley, there's kind of almost a yeah. hybrid, a value to that hybrid chimera. Um, and But the the one thing that's, that, that there's one thing that in here that I, I ended up still being quite, didn't, didn't get a really strong sense of how you thought about it, which is what is the importance of mortality? What, mm. what is it? Does it matter? Is that a dividing line that something is actually able to die, that they yeah. do die, they can't avoid death? I really think it is. Maybe it's getting older. Um, no, I, I've thought that even since my 20s. Um, I think it is, and I think it is one of the experiences we share as human beings now at least um and i think that it should uh, that it does not often enough but it is it it makes us you know it brings us back to ourselves it makes it makes us understand our significance and insignificance and it makes us perhaps cherish the fact that at the moment you know the the human beings who are alive in the world are the the entities perceiving meaning creating meaning creating laughter knowing that they are ephemeral. They're soap bubbles on the cosmic stage. Soap bubbles. Pop. And yet the words of someone who's been dust for 400 years can move me to tears. And so that seems vitally important. Would I therefore say, okay, we must outlaw longevity research? No. That would, I think, be an overreaction. But I think, and this goes back to your point about the yuck factor, which you put really well. Um, I think there can be folk wisdom in those just revulsions where we can't articulate it, but that's wrong. And sometimes, and, and particularly for people like me, for academics who get caught up in a web of words, and the, the web of words leads them further and further and further away, until they're caught up in the set of ideas and they've lost all connection. I mean, Raskolnikov in, in, in Crime and Punishment is exactly such a person. He's actually pretty decent, but words take him to this, this world of evil. And finally, it's sort of trusting natural instinct and religion, being Dostoevsky, that brings him back. So I think there is wisdom there. There's, there is wisdom in our folk wisdom, right? I'm not, I'm not scornful of it at all. I just think that we have to remember that the folk wisdoms of the past were things like, what on earth is a woman doing on a podcast, right? So it's sort of not, you know, maybe some of the folk wisdoms, eh, not so much. But I think, and again, for me, the, the, the message kept coming back to humility, which is the, the, the academic um, prestige um, rewards certainty. I have a theory. It's right. All of you are wrong. Um, and that's not the way I experience the world. And that will, I think, dissatisfy some readers of my book, because this is, this is a humanist book. This is an essayistic book. This is a book about trying to think right, knowing one is prone to error. So, With a little bit of comedy infused in there. <laughs> Lots yeah. of comedy, yes. but that's, that's <laughs> got to stay for the lulls. Yeah. And also science fiction. 
you, yes. you refer to it quite a lot. I'm, I'm uh, with, I'd, I'd be curious if you could just kind of replay a little bit um, for listeners the science fiction stories that you find to be most interesting, um, most relevant. Which ones were sort of of all the reading that you've done that you'd find most inspirational? And apologies to our listeners that our non human animal is trying to express her rights. <laughs> yeah. I she think this is apropos. Right in the background. <laughs> I stand up for their rights. <laughs> so thanks, Fanta. Um, so anyway, but if you could, if you could sort of well, d- d- describe a little bit where, the, where those inspirations come from and which stories you find to be most helpful in, in telling your story. Oh, thanks for that. And that, again, that made academics look at me very strangely. Like, why are you writing about fiction? This should be a philosophy book. Um, I found that um, two works in particular, Do Androids uh, Dream of Electric Sheep, Philip K. Dick's wonderful novel and the movie, the iconic movie based on it, Blade Runner, not the second version. Um, the current version, but thanks the for the clarification. 80s. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> the original. honest to goodness, you know, there's some things just and it should anyway. Um, they really, they'd always affected me deeply, and I never really put my finger on why. And then I started writing this book, and I went, and it, it was actually an epiphany. It was like, oh my god, that's what they're about. Um, you will remember in both of them, the thing that actually combined, you know, links the book and the and the movie is the Voigt-Kampf test, which is the test that is given to the replicants, the artificial humans, to, to see if they are human. And if they fail this test, they are killed by um, the Blade Runner, uh, Deckard, the, the protagonist in both book and movie, um, who is retiring them. And the test is a test of empathy. The, the empathy that you feel for non-human animals. And this is in a world where almost all non-human animals are dead, and so they are status symbols, objects highly prized, but also much more revered than they are in our world. And so the questions are things like, you know, you're, you're, uh, someone gives you a calfskin wallet for your birthday. I'd report them to the police is a correct, the correct answer. You know, your kid shows you, um, is a butterfly collector, shows you the, 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 the butterfly collection in the killing jar. It's like I'd take him to the psychiatrist. And um, the questions are designed to reveal whether or not the androids have empathy because it turns out that the test's premise is that they have insufficient empathy for a non-human species and thus they don't deserve to live. And so we are killing them with no empathy because of their absence of empathy. (laughs) It is the most brilliantly ironic twist it's a brain bomb and philip k dick leaves it there in plain sight and you're like oh my god who's being tested here the the replicants or us because wait like who's gonna give the humans the test and people are like is deckard a replicant no that's not the question is are we all replicants right it's it's that's philip k dick's point that's the point of the movie so um, I thought that was just an incredibly deep thing that shows that we can draw lines that make most people who read the book and see the movie not realize the deep irony that the thing that gets a replicate's filled is inadequate empathy towards non-human species. They are a non-human species. It's just perfect. So that was the first part. And then the second part is, I'm a real fan of the movie, um, and I think that, I think Ridley Scott is a genius, and the scene, particularly the, the scene where Pris, played by Daryl Hannah, is, is uh, hiding in the, 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 the Sib- Jeff Sebastian's workshop, which is full of mannequins and toys and wind-up toys and animatronic things. And you realize that you, he is clicking the switch from moment to a flashing a light. She's an animal. She's a wind-up doll. She's a mannequin. She's a killer robot. She's a really hot woman who I now feel attraction to. Oh, my God, I've just felt the hots for a sex robot. And he does it literally flash by flash by flash by flash and then has her dying in a way that makes her look both like an animal and like a machine. And what he, I say in the book, it's, it's a kind of moral stroboscope that is sort of seizure-inducing, but the seizure is a moral seizure where you're like, 
I realize you can trigger each of those reactions to Pris in a second because we have those frames in our minds. And that's what drives our empathy. And both of these great works of art are works about the limits of our empathy and how to broaden it. So that's why uh, sci-fi mattered so much to me. That's an awesome answer. Because um, it just explains so much about the importance of good sci-fi. <laughs> and I think I was, I was watching a, a um, YouTube of, or something with a um, biologist recently, and he, he was also into sci-fi. And the interviewer said something like, well, it just makes your Gantt chart shorter. <laughs> and I thought that was actually a pretty nice thing to say. <laughs> pretty, pretty short way of summing up what sci-fi is really about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's the ability to, to make strange the familiar for me. Mm. So it's, and Corey, I'm lucky enough to be buddies with Cory Doctorow, great sci-fi writer. And he's always like, it's not about predicting the future. That's, that, that's not what we're doing at all. It's about being able to keep some things in the world the same and change a few. And that's mm -hmm. what moral philosophers have always done. That's what philosophers have always done, right? It's, it's that ability to make you realize, going back to your original question, Helen, actually, and yours, um, Dave, that a little change in technology can destabilize our assumptions about pretty much everything. Except sex roles, apparently. The, 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 I love the thing, the, the, the great sci-fi golden era, sort of like everything changed except women are still in the kitchen, right? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and people still fight hand over hand, with, but with really sophisticated hand over hand things. Well, yes, exactly. Well, and and the, the, chain, the technology change, that's kind of what was going on when, you, when, I was, when you were describing that story from Blade Runner, which um, I remember really quite vividly. Amazing how some movies just completely stick with you. But the, the empathy test is that I, I, well, as you were describing it, I'm sort of thinking, hmm, how well might an LLM do on the empathy test today? Not yeah. because there's any true empathy in there, but because they're so good at completing sentences, right? right. And answering ba how humans would answer um, and mimicking, you know, providing that mirror to humanity. And I sort of wonder what would be the new test in a next sci-fi, you know, novel. Like what's, what's the next way of, what would be the next way of having that sort of, that, that, that test and that understanding? Of the and line? of course the, the Voidkamp test always, you know, also, you know, looked at sort of blood pressure, pupil dilation, like all of those other things, right? Um, so some kind of uh, notion that, you know, words alone were enough, weren't enough. And, and I, I, I suppose we could, insist on that there's there's needs to be some kind of physicality before we will um before we will say that you have rights but what will be our line i think it's pretty clear the turing test is dead the idea that um we must recognize that an entity thinks if it can carry on an unstructured conversation with us for a long period of time and have us not know whether or not it's a human being i mean i think we're already there that's mm. that's done and it's not a philosopher who sort of got rid of that test. It was not like the great philosophers have taken aim at it. I think relatively unsuccessfully in some cases. Um, that is to say they're right that the current um, chat GPT is basically, you know, simply a, a, a Chinese a Chinese room, a, a, a rule-following machine, but wrong to say that it could never be a machine that had uh, qualities like this. And, and in the book, I come out, I try a bunch of them. So... One is that we we will be most likely, whether this is right, but I think most it's most likely, we will recognize sentience or consciousness in entities that develop that consciousness in ways that we find comprehensible. So, you know, a, an AI that learned by interacting with the world at first clumsily and, you know, slowly, would, I think, convince more of us because you sort of like, yeah, I get that. That makes sense to me. Sit down in the chair is not just a set of words that it can manipulate. It knows what a chair is because it's fallen over one, mm -hmm. right? And it knows what the meanings of those things are. I think that the, the, the sort of the embodied mind idea that philosophers have written about, that makes some sense to me. I think another thing that might convince us is um, innovation. I mean, right now, of course, um, chat GPT, generative AI, is finding patterns in our data that we didn't know were there, 
And so, you know, maybe it can help you read a mammogram better than we could before. So that's great. Maybe there are links in scientific articles that you haven't seen. That would be wonderful. I'm all for it. But truly iconoclastic, transformative innovation that doesn't come from within our existing knowledge base, right? I think that would convince us, okay, that, that can't be fake. That's not just imitating us because we didn't do that, so it can't be imitating us. So that, I think, might convince us. And then finally, and this is, of course, where the AI doomers think that I've really lost my marbles. Um, it's sort of like arguing whether or not the Terminator should have more civil rights. Um, I think the um, ability of uh, artificially created entities to create communities, the polis, right, the, 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 the city-state, with themselves and with us, will make us say that really matters to us. And this goes back to Helen's question and, and your question about empathy. It's sort of like, that's what matters to us, right? It's not whether or not it's silicone or, you know, fleshy neurons doing the connection. It's the feeling of wanting to help. It's the feeling that that's wrong. <clears throat> it's even humor, <clears throat> which is basically, you know, um, subverted expectations. <laughs> so can I just, because I know you're going to be wrapping up. Mm -hmm. There's a quote. I think it's my favorite quote. Um, partly because it completely emphasizes and supports our business model. <laughs> <laughs> but I love this. Grappling with the question of synthetic others may bring about a re-examination of the nature of human identity and consciousness. I want to stress the potential magnitude of that re-examination. This process may offer challenges to our self-conception, unparalleled since secular philosophers declared that we would have to learn to live with a God-shaped hold at the center of the universe. I just think that kind of nails <laughs> that, that, that what's real, you know, what are the stakes here? If yeah. you don't start thinking about this, um, there are practical things we can do, but really just wrestling with the ideas and getting used to the fact that rightly or wrongly, we are developing something that's going to unseat us in a way that we just unprepared for and have never had to face. I find this a, um, Fascinating to actually, you know, have a conversation with someone who also drinks that same Kool Aid, like from, <laughs> but from you know a slightly different, from a different tap in the and it's in and the it's thing. spiked too, um, very much so. I was watching Francis Collins, um, former director of the NIH, on Stephen Colbert, and he's a deeply uh, devout Christian, um, and um, and he also believes in science. He believes in evolution. Uh, and when the theory of evolution was first gaining acceptance, the idea that we could reconcile the vision of humanity that evolution gives us with any kind of traditional Christian or other theological viewpoint would have seemed ludicrous. And the idea that, it, we, that our existing vision of ourselves, that human beings in the world would remain intact would have seemed ludicrous. We kind of worked through that. Um, I'm not a person of faith. Um, I respect Dr. Collins's faith. It's not mine. But what I'm fascinated by is that we took something over, you know, 150 years, we took something that seemed like it just knocked the sticks from under us, and we wrestled with it, and at least those of us who don't deny evolution, and we seem to come to a better and richer and more morally appropriate conclusion. And so my hope is we might do that here, but then I'm Scottish, so I'm not that much of an optimist. One final question for you. We've talked about Philip K. Dick. We've talked about the movie Blade Runner, obviously based on his book. If you had to give a, if you, if you could give um, listeners a, a short reading list or watching list of things to help them think through this, as you said, your book is not here to tell us what to think. But to, I think, say how to think, I think is what you said earlier, right? So what other inspirations, points of reference, places from fiction or other nonfiction, whatever, would you give people to sort of say to help them get their heads around this challenge? What an incredibly good question, and I have no good answer. I mean, I would certainly mention those, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the sci-fi that I mentioned. I would suggest um, going back and looking at Adam Smith theory of the moral sentiments and, and thinking more about empathy 
um, and seeing like where empathy takes you. Um, I'd, I'd also say that one of the things we might end up doing, that AI might end up doing, is might say we we could conclude, well, maybe humans aren't that special and maybe we actually are more like ChatGPT than we think we are. And I don't believe that. Um, but I think we will wrestle with that. And interestingly, reading some of the modern research on consciousness, global neuronal workspace theory, all of that kind of stuff, integrated information theory, it's striking to me how m many, a lot of people think scientists probably deny the existence of consciousness. They probably just think we're stimulus and response machines. Not really. Uh, a lot of the most sophisticated ones believe that consciousness is real. We experience it. And they're trying to figure out how it works from the middle. So I guess what I would say is all these people in all these domains are actually rest wrestling with the question of the line. So go out, read some non-human rights, you know, Peter Singer, read some Adam Smith, read some sci-fi and just think really hard about the lines you draw in your own life. Yeah. I picked up Peter Singer when I was about 16, I think. And, um, and well, my first thing was, well, I'm never not going to eat meat, but, um, <laughs> and that changed from time to time. But, um, that, it's amazing how if you if you pick up that kind of kind of very purist, quite in some ways quite extreme sort of pushing philosophy or science at a young age, it can send you on that trajectory for forever. Yeah, it's because that is such a line that we grew up thinking was just so. I mean, I grew up on a farm, you know, you know, so it was quite clear who the animals were there for. <laughs> it was there was no doubt. Um, <laughs> Um, as one of my friends who grew up in a farm goes, yeah, it's like, I find animal rights people very interesting. It's like and the animal on the farm didn't do what we want. We, kill, uh, we killed it. <laughs> and um, having that view questioned was seismic. Mm. Uh, and, but sort of it vastened me, you know, it, it made me larger in a way that other than just my waistline. And, and so I think that's, for me, that's, that is the joy of this. The process of discovery is which I find in scholarship, is is joy. I mean, it's excitement. It's dancing with someone who's been dead for 500 years. I mean, that's just really cool. Well, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk with us today, and thank you for your book. Um, we really enjoyed it. And uh, as I said at the beginning, it is uh, great to have another um, form of scholarship come into the, the mashup that goes on in our minds as we think of these things. So thank you so much for all of the years that you put into this and all of the rewrites. Uh, it's definitely worth it. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for having me. And I will say, and this is, you can cut it out. It's not BS. This is actually, I think, the deepest interview that I've ever had, maybe at all, but certainly the deepest interview that I've ever had on these issues. And I've talked about it a lot. Uh, this got into, if you were to have asked me, what are the things that you really would love to talk to about, but probably were pretty sure you never will, then you hit pretty much all of them. So thank you very much. Spirit, spirit,